Welcome back, everyone. Uh, now we have Pavas Ghali, uh, and he'll be speaking about running machine learning analytics on traces. Take it away, Pavas. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I will make it quick today. I just being told that I have half an hour to go through my slides. Um, essentially, it's like Neil Stevenson idea. So I'm here just presenting the idea. Obviously, whatever I talk about today can also be applicable to any domain you're working with. So it doesn't have to be traces. It doesn't have to be machine learning. Because as, as you can see from the title here, there are a couple of keywords that we will go through today. And essentially, what we want to make sure is to focus on the real time of the story, basically. So real time, in general, um, uh, refers to, to doing things in the moment now. And if I ask you now, what does real time mean to you? Probably you will give me different answers. So some of you might say, I don't know, maybe a couple of seconds, others might say a couple of minutes. Some people might refer even to yesterday's event and so on. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, that what real time is, is kind of like, you know, events going or, you know, at transactions going in this moment. So, for example, if we talk about a blink of eye, which is like, you know, we all do it, but we don't notice. It's kind of like it's one third of a second, so that's pretty quick. Um, you can't actually, even if you can see it, you can't actually see all blinks, basically. Same thing if you want to clap your hands, that takes about one, one third of a second. If you have a mobile camera and you try to take some photos, this is like where the flash takes like around one thousand of the second. So that's pretty quick. And it's everywhere. It's not specific on logs or traces. It could be financial situations, ba banks and so on. Or it could be, I don't know, an Internet of Things like GPS coordinates, mobile devices, uh, medical devices, hospitals, sports in general, and also AI. So we'll be focusing today on the machine learning side of the story. But to do this, we need to actually understand what is the secret sauce. So when I say secret sauce, I refer to what is essentially working currently. So if you look at multiple applications, so we're talking about large scale applications. So um, essentially, it's hard for you know, a human to track everything. So it's like doing the work manually requires time and effort. Uh, at the same time, it's, it becomes really hard when you want to handle it in real time. So remember, we're trying to avoid any latency in running the application. And this is like mission critical application. So for example, um, Google has done some research about how long it takes you to switch between apps. So if you open, try to open any app, X app on your mobile, how long it takes before you close the app and open a new app if the app doesn't respond. So, and they found like it's like 100 milliseconds. So that's really quick. So even like, yeah, you, you can't basically tell what's going on here. So you want to make sure to have like high performance real time processing as well as robust machine learning algorithm or model running at the same time. So if you're coming from data science background, I don't know, or you know, machine learning background, you probably spend so much time on developing the optimal model for your application, which is good, but it, this is like only part of the story. What you want to make sure is kind of like develop a story based on the context, and the context referred to what's going on now. So you need combination between the two in order to deliver a success, basically, onto your application. So why are we talking about this today? Why, why is this important, especially for traces? Um, so for those who do work in, in traces and scales, essentially, it's kind of like a mess here. Uh, even for small applications, if you try to basically output all relevant information, so whether it's information or warning and different log levels, so it's, it becomes really as like, you know, stack of hay, and if you want to find specific information, whether it's like, I don't know, mission critical or error or so on, or you know, anything re related to the mission you're trying to do, it becomes really hard to do it by human. Even if you want to write an application, it, it becomes really um, out of scale, out of scope, basically, if you want to scale it. So scaling is bottleneck manual 
logging doesn't work. So that's why we, know, we want to make sure that we apply machine learning and we don't want to make it sure that we apply it in real time. So this will give us some, some kind of predictions what is going to happen in your application. So essentially we will use previous or the log history to try to check what's going to happen next. So are, is your application going to crash, for example? Are you expecting to have high, uh, high, high spikes in your application? So these type of questions like it can be used in this, in this domain where we talk about the early anomaly detection or even if you want to provide some alerts. So usually if you do this work for you check log files and you do conditions and check, and this is fine if you want to handle you know, what happened before, but if you want to handle what's going to happen now, or even if you want to predict it in the future, you need some kind of machine learning algorithm running into place. Also, like, you want to define trends in your logs, so now this is, like, um, obviously um, a hidden area. Nobody knows what type of trends exist in your log, so if, um, for, if for example, your boss comes and asks you, how is your application doing, and Essentially, you want to go through logs maybe or some kind of benchmark or some kind of performance matrices to just to make sure that you understand full picture, which is great. But this change over time, it doesn't work the same way because like, for example, if you have steady states of events, uh, this will refer to steady states of logs as well or traces, which is good. But if you got some kind of spikes, for example, you need to change and you usually don't handle this scaling in an efficient way simply because you're not expecting it. Nobody can. So even like if you have some kind of online shopping, for example, this is just an example, and you have a specific date. So for example, when people get paid, they spend money online shopping and so on. So that's, you know, that you get some sparks in you know, your the trades or your transactions as well as in your traces. But the same thing also applies to, like, for example, Black Friday, Christmas, and so on. But sometimes out of the blue, if a company drops out a new product and they did a good uh, marketing scheme for it, probably you get also get some kind of spikes that you don't expect as well. So defining these trends is important. Now, um, if I ask you how many log messages would you say that you can handle or your application can handle, what would you say? Do you have some number in mind? So some of you might say like a few hundreds, others might look at some kind of, uh, you know, um, few thousands. But if we look at it, if you want to scale it, right? So for example, I don't know, Uber, for example, or Facebook or Twitter, or even like Amazon, these kind of like um, applications or companies have very, high number of transactions and traces to track. And essentially you want to basically make sure to have a mechanism, not only to store it, but also to analyze it, right? So um, the traces files, usually you end up with giga or even gigabytes or even terabytes of log files. So now it becomes really hard to, you know, to do it on your own if you want to analyze and understand the context. And that's why what we're talking about today is kind of like a platform to allow you to do so. Um, so the platform itself is open source, it's called Hazelcast. So those who, of you who heard of Hazelcast know what we're talking about. If you haven't heard of Hazelcast, it's an open source real-time stream processing platform which allows you basically to handle what we're talking about. Remember, you don't have to be a machine learning expert. Um, so even like you don't need experience in a specific programming language and the platform will handle different connectors. But if we look at it from the perspective of the use case we're talking about today, so we have on the left side of the screen kind of like your input sources. So this is where your trace is coming from. So usually traces comes from applications, but that's not always the case. So sometimes even for your applications, traces can come from different sources, right? So Imagine yeah, you developed a bank application, payment application for, I don't know, for a specific bank and they requested you to add a fraud detection algorithm to into it or module into it, which you did and you did the traces. Now, if you want to handle traces, just to make sure that you actually know what's going on in terms of, you know, if there is a fraud case or not, 
probably traces by itself doesn't give you the answer. So traces um, mechanism doesn't give you the answer. So you want to add more sources. So what do I mean by more sources? So for example, GPO coordinates, where is this person is located? So for example, I mean, I'm today in Belgrade, I come from the UK. If my car, car, current card is currently being used in the UK, so that's where they can use a GB coordinates to check where is the location. And you can also use this information into your traces. So this, this is one example of our example might be, I don't know, weather, what is the difference between um, you know, local weather or some other countries, some other places. So all these can happen or even applications, uh, multiple applications. So remember what we're talking about is not a simple um, small application. We're talking about large scale applications where we have maybe 20K, 30K of transactions per second. So you want to make sure to handle this. And usually you will be responsible about a either module or a, I don't know, a microservice and at the same time someone else or some other teams will be responsible about multiple microservices so you want to have access not only to your traces but traces coming from other microservices as well so you can imagine now how hard it is to you know provide some kind of ma machine learning uh, model to analyze and try to predict trends within your traces so from these sources, we take two elements into the platform. So the platform has two components. So one is called the fast data management or operational store. Usually you, uh, you work with this. So you store your traces into files, for example, on your hard disk, or some of you might store it in databases and so on. So if you want to read it every time, to, you want to do some kind of analysis, it's probably not the best idea. So you want to make sure first to load it into memory when it's, in, it's in, in memory, you probably have a faster response. So you want to avoid latency. So remember that we're talking about machine critical or you know, instant uh, responses. So this is the first step where you, you can speed up the process, but it doesn't give you the full picture. What you want to use is the streaming engine. So the streaming engine allows you to do some kind of, I don't know, data aggregation. For example, if you have multiple sources, and at the same time, it does the transformation if you want, and also the stream processing. So for machine learning, so the machine learning is essentially takes models written in different programming languages, and you can actually run it either locally, for example, on your own cluster, or you're running on the cloud. So for the sake of explaining how hard it is and how complex, what we will be doing is um, uh, transferring our logs into cloud. So now this might be counterintuitive for you. Why do you want do you want to transfer your logs into the cloud? So this is, doesn't make sense. Um, and you might be right. So if you're working, for example, with a small application, uh, you probably don't need to send it into the cloud because it doesn't. You, you're actually adding extra time to it. Uh, but if you're working with large scale application, you want to have access as fast as possible, especially if you have data stores and data centers located in different places around the world, the best way to do it is to store it in the cloud. This will give you more efficient response in terms of accessing your logs, traces, and also for your machine learning model when you deploy it. So that's the part where we're talking why we want to move it into the cloud. Obviously, we are not all Java developers here, so depending on which programming language you use. Sometimes you use some kind of like C Sharp or C++ or Node.js to do this process. And even if you're data scientists, you probably don't want to spend time trying to learn a new programming language. Obviously, you shift towards the SQL interface. So the SQL interface allows you to do everything we're talking about in you know SQL format. And so once you finish from, you know, Processing your data, you can simply output it. So for example, I don't know, the most obvious way is you want to have some kind of alerts into your system. So whenever you have some kind of, I don't know, critical messages coming from your alert, uh, from your traces, you want to do some kind of alerts. So you can send it to mobile device or I don't know, Slack channel or even like some kind of web interface or web socket. So this kind of like the platform what can allow you to do. Um, with that being said, let's just discuss about the infrastructure. So 
what we're talking about now, we are getting the streaming events. So in our case, these are the actual traces coming into the platform. And you don't need also to have your machine learning model running within your application. What you can do is you deploy it somewhere else. And I will explain why it is important. So after all, there is no perfect model, regardless, like even any application you use now or any website uses some kind of machine learning, they don't have the same model running all the time because it's not possible. Trends change over time. Um, and then when, once you have your machine learning model, you can actually import it into the platform and this will give you some kind of interaction with your microservices. Now, how does it work for the machine learning part of it? So the machine learning part of it requires us to focus more on um, having multiple ingestion. So remember for your traces coming from different sources, so from different applications or from different microservices or from different sources. So you want to make sure to have ingestion process for each of you know traces um, part uh, or traces source. And this is where you can interact with the Python. So the, for those who know Java, you have a Java virtual machine. And if you want to deploy, for example, Python code on your Java virtual machine, you can do so by implementing or using the Python virtual machine. So essentially what we're saying is you can run your machine learning model written in Python in Java. Yes, you can run machine learning model in Java straight away, but it's not optimal. And yes, you can run everything in Python. But again, this is not optimal because when we, you scale your application and you have some kind of enterprise inter infrastructure, you need some kind of Java deployment. This will allow you to be more efficient. And why it is important? Because when it comes to scaling, you want to scale it based on your compute and on your data. So everyone uh, here has some kind of scaling mechanism within their application. Either they work on or they use. And usually scaling refers to two components. So you have scaling on data. So this is basically how large your trace, or traces files are or your compute. So this is based on your machine learning model and your Java code or whatever code you use. So you want to make sure to store your data as close as possible to your compute. Um, so for example, if you have streaming ingestion, I don't know, for, for example, weather data, so, and you store it in, in London, for example, London data store. If you have machine learning, learning model to predict weather, for example, for next day or next hour, you probably need to, to deploy it in London data center. Same thing applies for other, other, uh, other, other um, cluster and other nodes. So this will allow you to run as close as possible to your data as well as your compute. And it's also like it's partition aware. So even if you don't do it by hand, the platform will allow you to do so by increasing number of nodes within your um, application. Now, most of you who heard of machine learning or use machine learning, uh, usually um, the story is the first part here. So you have some kind of input, you want to do some kind of model on it, uh, and then you have some kind of prediction. Um, obviously, we spend so much time on this part here. So I come from data science background, and I have PhD in computer science, and we spend so much time on trying to tweak models to make sure that it runs as expected. And essentially, if you have 100%, we probably spend like, or I don't know, maybe 80 to 85% just on the model, not on the data. And this is fine if you want to develop model, but if you want to deploy it, especially in production, you probably need some different mechanism. I will explain in just one second here why. So what you want to make sure is not to spend time on you know best machine learning model. So don't look for best solution or best machine learning algorithm. That's not the answer. The answer is basically a combination between multiple models. So why this is important? Because trends change over time. So whatever is valid now, there is no guarantee it will be valid after, you know, after now, basically, whether it's like after a few hours or after a few days and so on. So for example, I'll give you an example. If you have a link, LinkedIn profile or Twitter or 
any application which you can run it on your mobile as well as on your laptop at the same time. So if, for example, if you try to open your LinkedIn profile now on your laptop as well as on your mobile, you probably will see different events coming into your feed. Yes, you will see some shared, but usually it's not 100%. It's like kind of like different between these two platforms. And that's what that's the reason of this because LinkedIn uses different algorithms to run their models. So whatever runs on your mobile is completely different from what it runs on your laptop. So that's important because trends change over time and there's no way to predict what is going to happen next in terms in terms of best machine learning model. So what you can do is to develop set of models. So for example, if you want to do traces um, um, or machine learning on traces, what you need to do is to develop set of models. So for example, you use linear regression, you use random forest tree and so on. And once you develop these models, you deploy it on multiple nodes. This will run basically, obviously you need to do some kind of check before you deploy it. But once you have it, in production mode, what you need to do is to have some kind of switch between these nodes. What does it mean? It means you ch uh, the data is coming in real time and it changes over time as well. So that's, it's not the same data. So not, uh, it's not the same trends. It's because essentially, even if you have different values, trend might change. So this is this is critical because it means you have to switch. So you turn off what is not working now from your machine learning model and you turn on what is working basically and you need to avoid downtime time. So downtime time here refers to how many, you know, I don't know, like you heard 24 seven, but is it accurate 24 seven? The answer is no. So because if you move from 99.99, .99, so that's four nine um, percent to 99.999, so that's five nines. Essentially, you know, <laughs> um, you might spend like, I don't know, millions of dollars just to get this five nines instead of four nines. So this is like where you have some kind of availability between four nines to five nines. So we're t even so still 24 seven, but we just can't avoid losing this type of, con especially if you're develop or deploying it in real time. So you, the idea is to have some kind of um, deployment, which I will just show you in a second. But before I do this, I mentioned 20K transaction, but that's not the case. It's just a, you know, a one sample scenario. If you're, we're talking about traces and if your um, requirements require you to tr log everything, basically, and everything means everything, you probably end up with like, I don't know, millions of traces or min millions of messages. So what we did is we ran a benchmark here just to test out the, how many uh, events we can handle. And we managed to run 1 billion events. So that's really massive. And that was only on 45 nodes, which is great. But also the linear scaling was also very nice to have. And I, I thought that this is large number when I heard of 1 billion when we did it. And essentially all these companies like Uber, Netflix, and so on, probably they have like 10 times more than this number. So hopefully this gives you a flavor what we're talking about, how many traces we are handling and why it is important even to deploy it in an efficient way. So the deployment itself um, requires us to have some kind of, you know, you have your platform, you have your application and it runs, uh, as I mentioned, I, I, I call it py slow Python because simply the same code if you run it just as is or you know deploy it as is and run it through java the machine learning will be more efficient and faster as well so you can have some kind of model running into the platform so that's the um, as close as possible to your compute or you can actually replicate it so replicating mean you add multiple models so this is where your machine learning algorithms are located and we have a feature called auto scaling. Auto scaling refers to scale up and down. So again, if your boss comes to you and asks how much money we need to spend on your application and you say 10K uh, and they agree on this, uh, 10K is not an answer. So there is no way to know the average, how much a, an application will cost to run simply because you have a spikes, as I mentioned. So which means you need more resources. 
And most times, like, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning, nobody is using your application. You probably have also like less usage as well. So one way to do handle it is to use the auto scaling feature, which means basically you actually can scale it up and down. So for the deployment, so you can deploy it locally, as I will show you in my demo today. Uh, and this will give us some kind of, you know, um, fast response on your reports, or you can actually have the sidecar, which is like on the edge. So those who work on the edge know how, it, essentially it means not inside your cluster, just on the edge, so as close as possible. Or even you can create your own farm. So your farm, essentially, you have your application running somewhere, and you completely have your bots or you know machine learning farm running on completely separate, um, you know, location basically. So for the demo, what we're talking about today is the traces. So how do we do it? So as I mentioned, that like logs in general are hard to to you know analyze by eye, or even if you want to write application, you, you need to make sure you your application can access logs, process it, and provide output without losing any logs coming. And that's not possible, right? Because that's three stages, and we are all limited in network hopes. So we have some limitations in our applications, no matter how much time uh, you spend on you know, enhancing your performance. So from this log, we, what we can do is simply we can use I don't know if it's clear here. So the SLF4J, so this is a library for logging mechanism. What we do is, you know, we write the log file using this library and we import it into Hazelcast. And in, in Hazelcast, what we try to do is some kind of providing some kind of trend. So trend will tell me, are my, are my, are my traces going as expected? Um, obviously, you need machine learning model for it. And if the answer is yes, that's fine. If not, try to predict what's going to happen next. So from here, you can see IB addresses for traces where they're coming from and timestamp attached to it. And the zero or one, that's the output or outcome. So if you expect to have a normal output, that will be zero. If you, there is some kind of um, anomaly, you can actually have or the value will be one. So to develop it, the we are using is something called IMAP. So what we are storing is uh, uh, we're storing the log. So for the log message, we have the IB address, timestamp, as well as message. We, store, we try to predict the trend. So the trend itself, in my case, what I use is linear regression. But as I've mentioned, it's not important. So you can, for example, use random forestry or any model, or even if you want to deploy it in production, basically you need to have multiple models running at the same time. And from my trend, what I do is try to predict what's going to happen next for my next log, log message or next, next log uh, set of uh, log messages. So the message itself is a, I don't know, you can change it, obviously. Uh, so basically, we take some data just to make sure what we're talking about. So we have the local map. So that's uh, the map we're dealing with. Uh, obviously, if it doesn't exist, you create it. And then we store the v key value here. So the key, as I mentioned, is the look, IB address timestamp. And then we can you have the circuit address for four. And then you can have level for the trace message and thread name, where it's coming from, which thread, and the logger name. Obviously, you store it in JSON format. The idea of using JSON format, as I will show you, is simply will give you the option to output it into various, uh, various outputs, so web sockets, alerts, and so on. And you define a Hazelcast instance. So this instance will allow me to actually um, run the JET streaming process within the platform. And the logger itself has two classes. So the first class is the IMAP log, uh, logger factory. So this is where we try to create the log messages here. And as you can see, so you get all instances. So remember, we're running multiple instances. And you don't care how many instances you run. So that's because the number will change over time. So whether it's more or less. And from there, we can get based on the clients. So how many clients we have. 
and we simply iterate on this just to make sure we have a right message out of it. And essentially, we we link it to the IMAP logger, so that will implement logger where we take this message and we store it into the Hazelcast. Obviously, for the Hazelcast itself, uh, you have the cloud option, so everything you do, you can actually out, um, you know, log it into the cloud. So everything you have in terms of traces, you don't store it locally, you can store it on the cloud. So that's pretty much I, I want. So we have a Slack community open so for the open source. So if you have any question about real-time stream processing or machine learning, or even combination about the traces, you can join us. Or we have also Twitch streams. That's where you, we go through some live coding blocks and yeah. With that being said, uh, thanks very much for listening, and I'm open for questions. Thank you.